Okay, we are live on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. Okay, to everyone who's here already, we'll go ahead and get started soon in a couple of minutes. Um, we got some feedback that uh, folks wanted us to try to start right on time, but of course there's always stragglers coming in in the first five minutes of the talk. So we'll just do our best to balance that. YouTube's working fine, Jen. You can hear me okay now, right? Yeah, you sound great. All right, we'll start in just a minute or two. Um, let some of the stragglers go ahead and then join up. All right, let's, um, let's go ahead and get started. What do you guys say? Yep. All right, great. So hi everyone, uh, welcome to this week's installment of the Cell Migration Seminar Series. Um, so we have two talks for y'all today uh, and a quick reminder that we'll save all questions for the end of the talks. So first up, um, we have Professor Ming Guo. Ming's background is in applied physics and mechanical engineering, and he's currently an associate professor at um, the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Physics of Living System Center at MIT. Today, he'll be telling us about biomechanical imaging of cells, extracellular matrix, and cancer invasion in 3D. All right, Ming, if you can want to go ahead and start screen sharing, the floor is yours. Can you all see the screen? Yep, looks great. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, let me just, uh, all right. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, my group works on cell mechanics. Mainly we uh, develop new tools to probe the mechanics of cells, uh, matrix and also uh, cell matrix interactions. Um, a lot on single cells level, but more and more also on multicellular context. So here, uh, for example, if you can see uh, the image on the left, is a, a, a slice of human breast tissue. 
And the purple ones are the nice and cute cells, but they're an enormous space filled with extracellular matrix between cells. It's a collaboration between uh, cells and the cells in the matrix eventually form a nice structure with a certain functionality. And only one centimeter away in the same uh, person is this side as the breast cancer. Yeah. You can uh, clearly see that all the nice structures are messed up. Um, so we're aiming to understand what's going on during this process from a fundamental mechanics and the material science perspective. Um, um, fundamentally, how a subcellular structure come up to a single cell with a certain uh, mechanical property and functionality, and uh, among many cells, how they form a living tissue. Um, and of course, the uh, ultimate hope is so based on this understanding, we're hoping to develop new diagnosis and treatment tools. Um, but uh, parallel effort, we're also trying to engineer living systems based on this understanding. Um, so what I want to do today is um, quickly go over a few projects in my group um, that hopefully uh, um, each of the project will have some relevance to cell migration. Um, all right, um, so the main tool that we use is optical tweezers. And on the left side is a, a very early version when I was still allowed to take a picture. Uh, right now it's all boxed up, but in the video, if you can see, this is as we use the optical tweezer to manipulate a particle that is being taken by the cell. Um, here, this particle is being trapped by a laser beam and it dragged to the right side. And by doing that, we can measure the force displacement curve as we use the particle to deform the cell, which allow us to measure the mechanical properties such as elasticity and the plasticity of the cell. Um, all right. So the first project that I want to talk about is about intermediate filament in the cytoskeleton. Um, as you can see in the image on the left, um, there are three major types of uh, cytoskeleton components. We're more familiar with F-actin and uh, microtubules, which have a lot of motor proteins to play with, and uh, they're very active. They constantly reorganize themselves. But there's the third type is the intermediate filament in the cytoskeleton. Um, in the image, what I show here is a mouse embryonic fibroblast, and the yellow uh, network is the intermediate filament. You can see that they take a, a lot of space in the cell. However, they turn over much slower, and uh, intermediate filament is one of the categories that remain largely underexplored. It's not really clear what their functionalities are. Um, however, it's known that they are related to many different types of diseases. For example, the Wymentan. Uh, that I will talk about today. It's known that they're a marker for epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Um, and there are studies to show that compared to a cell with one maintain, if you knock one maintain out, their migration, at least on 2D, slow down quite a bit. Um, so we want to answer the question mechanically what's the role of uh, intermediate filament. Um, and to do that, we use a cell pair that is produced by Bob Goldman's lab at the Northwestern. Uh, on the left is the regular uh, mouse embryonic fibroblast. You can see the nice y mentan And on the right side, uh, the y mentan is being knocked out. And all the other components he checked uh, remain the same. The only difference is y mentan So that allows us to measure the mechanical property with and without y mentan But to further get a cleaner response uh, to uh, purely on y mentan we also produced this um, uh, why maintain enriched the cytoskeleton. I like to call it ghost cell because if you look at uh, the, the, this video or the picture on top, the color represents the height. It looks like a, a, a living cell. However, it's not, but it's also not being fixed. What we do is we basically wash away uh, the, the cell membrane, dissolve uh, and wash away actin, microtubule and all the other proteins. And then what's left over after repeated uh, washing is basically intermediate filament and maybe DNA, those robust uh, long uh, polymers. Um, and in the cytoskeleton, mainly is what maintain in this case, um, um, and uh, which allows us to directly measure uh, the mechanics of one maintain networks in a more native state since you don't have to reproduce this network, just use whatever in the cell, okay? Um, and uh, uh, as we uh, have a particle in the cell and it starts to pull on it, um, the blue curve is the first displacement curve in a regular cell. Um, you can see as I start to drag the particle, the force increase, 
until a point it starts to decrease. Uh, this means the uh, uh, cytoplasm is uh, being yielded, either fracture or deformized. Therefore, the fluid decreases. Um, but if I do the same experiment in the one minute knockout cell, which is the green curve, you can clearly see that the response is a lot weaker. It requires a much weaker force. It breaks a lot easier. The strength is a lot lower. Um, the interesting thing is if I do the same measurement with the ghost cell, which only has one minute, clearly you can see initially it's even weaker than the knockout cell. However, as soon as your displacement is beyond 50% of strength, the y maintenance starts to dominate. So it really takes over the nonlinear response and dominates the strength and stretchability in the several of the uh, nonlinear material problems. And uh, with the Twizzler, we also do repeated loading, load, unload, load, unload, which allows us to measure the toughness, for example, the energy absorption by the material. And uh, it shows y maintenance also dominates the toughness of the material. Uh, for more details, you can read this paper. So here's what we think. If a cell doesn't have intermediate filament, as you have a local loading, it's very easy to break the surrounding actin and microtubule network. Therefore, the stress strain doesn't go out. So the deformation is very localized. Um, however, if you do have intermediate filament, and for this case is one minton, they're nonlinear, they have a high strength, and they don't really break. So when you deform a local network, you break the local F actin and microtubule. However, the one minute intermediate filament is still effectively disperse the stress and strain out to involve more actin and microtubule in, uh, in a bigger area into a local de uh, uh, deformation. Therefore, it can absorb more energy and have a, a higher toughness um, 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 as a result. So to um, um, confirm that, we uh, while we use optical tweezer to pull on a particle in the cell, we also directly imaging the structure around a cell. As you can see on top, this is after we image the displacement and we perform PIV to calculate uh, the, the uh, displacement field um, as shown by the arrows. You can see in the cell with one minute the displacement field is a lot wider as compared to the video on the bottom, which doesn't have one minute. And of course, you can calculate the normal strain. For example, in this case, you clearly see that upon any local perturbation, the displacement field or strength field is, uh, is much wider in uh, the cell with one minute. Okay, um, why is this important? Um, I think this is quite relevant to cell migration. As we know, on 2D, if you don't have one minute, migration slow down. This may be related to having one minute can protect the cells mechanically as cells undergo sudden or large deformation. As a quick uh, uh, proof of concept, we embed cells in a piece of hydrogel and then start to stretch the hydrogel two or three times long. As you can see, the calcium stand, the cells, the cell is really being stretched two or three times longer. And in the knockout cell case, they're embedded and being deformed for half an hour, more than half of the cells die after uh, the stretch. Um, and however, if you do the same thing with regular mouse embryonic fibroblast, upon half an hour stretch, um, most of them are still alive. So this is a strong evidence to show that intermediate filament in the static skeleton is an important mechanical player to maintain cell mechanical integrity. Um, all right, so hopefully this can shed some light uh, on understanding why maintain related cell migration. And uh, the second topic I wanna to talk about is uh, about how to probe cell matrix interaction. So we know that on 2D, if you grow cells on a substrate, they can sense the stiffness of the substrate and they can even respond to it. Um, and uh, if you grow cells in 3D hydrogel, similar results can be seen as well. Um, but the question we have is, if you look at a, a cell, for or in this case is the breast cancer cell, in blue uh, spread in a three-dimensional collagen hydrogel, um, besides the cell spreading, you can clearly see that they also uh, pull on the collagen fibers nearby and they strongly reorganize the uh, surrounding uh, collagen matrix. And then the question we have is, do they actually also change the mechanical property in the collagen matrix near them? And if they do change their mechanics, do they feel it? Do their neighbors feel it, right? Um, and uh, um, the measurement is, again, very simple. Um, during the polymerization of the sample, we put in uh, polystyrene particles. The particles are large enough, therefore they're trapped by the mesh. So they're not going anywhere. 
um, and, and which allow us to shine again a few tweezer on them to trap it and then pull on a particle to measure the local force displacement curve in this collagen matrix, um, which allow us to get an elastic property of the matrix. Um, and here is the result. As we measure far away from the spreading cell, um, these are uh, uh, the data points, which roughly represent what's going on uh, when you measure uh, collagen in bulk. Um, the interesting thing is when we measure closer and closer to the cell, as shown by the red data here, you see a dramatic increase in the measured stiffness. The matrix becomes stiffer and stiffer. And this stiffness enhancement can be as high as two orders of magnitude, and sometimes it's a three orders of magnitude. So it seems the cells really created a very stiff shell around them into a large ring that spread out into 20, 30 microns. And why this is happening? Um, it's widely known that biopolymers are nonlinear. What this means is um, they're uh, stress stiffening or strength stiffening. If you have a biopolymer network, they have a certain mechanical property, right? And when you pull on them or stretch them, the harder you stretch, the stiffer they are. Um, and uh, um, in this case, when we have a cell spreading in the three dimensional collagen, what we think is happening is the cells spread out and they generate a strong contractile field inducing contractile stresses in the 3D matrix, uh, which decay over distance. And near the cell tip, the contractile stress is so strong that it's enough to drive the collagen matrix up into a nonlinear stiffening regime to be much stiffer. And of course, this contractile stress decay over distance, therefore the amount of stiffening also decay over distance. Um, and uh, um, the important information here is cell contraction itself seems to be nonlinearly trigger a stiffening near them. Um, it will be interesting to know whether their neighbors in them can feel it. Um, and as a, a, a demonstration of contraction is inducing this, after we measure this uh, a dramatic stiffening, we also uh, relax the cell. Um, for example, use the uh, cytoclasin D in this case, you can also use the blab setting. And after you do that, uh, the dramatic stiffening regime is much weaker. Um, the gap here is completely due to the cell active contraction. And even after you relax the cell completely, there's still a little bit uh, stiffening that possibly is due to remodeling of the cell on the collagen matrix. All right. Um, so um, it seems the cell contraction generated contractile stress can not linearly drive the local matrix stiffening. And then the, uh, it, it means the uh, tractile stress information is encoded in this local stiffness. The question we ask next, next is, can we actually use the matrix stiffness to infer the stress, kind of do this backward calculation? And the answer is yes, it's actually quite simple. Um, so here in the middle, is a nonlinear stiffness curve that we measured again using optical tweezers is plotted as the stiffness as a function of the stress that we apply. Okay. Um, it looks very similar to um, um, many other types of biopolymers. So for example, here I show is the uh, uh, F-acting network. As you increase the pre-stress, the stiffness also increase. And if you look at the nonlinear regime, the stress is correlated with the stiffness. The larger stress you apply, the larger stiffness it has, right? That also means if I know the stiffness, I can do the reverse measure to directly know how large the stress is uh, being applied onto the network as a way to measure the stress. And that's exactly what we do here. So we know that uh, when we measure the collagen matrix stiffness near the cell, is the matrix is a lot stiffer. And the reason is because the cell contractile stress is strong enough that drive the matrix up into a nonlinear regime. So all we need to do is take the measure of the stiffness value, use this reference curve to directly read out how large the stress is needed at that particular local region to drive, drive that local matrix up to that certain amount of stiffening. Um, and you can do that very easily, very successfully um, that we show uh, for example, stresses that generated by uh, this breast cancer cell in collagen, it decays over distance. And we can apply this in any types of nonlinear materials, for example, fibrin, and we can also do it in mixture gel. 
uh, with a different cell type. Um, and also you may notice that the, the uh, contractile stresses decay over distance quadratically. So this is actually quite interesting. There are some uh, very uh, interesting uh, understanding there. If you want to know the details, um, please read this paper in more uh, details. Um, and the point here, I think, uh, quite relevant to cell migration, especially in 3D, is when you have a cell that's spread out in 3D, they generate the, the stresses are strong enough to create a stiff shell that may affect themselves and may affect the neighbors to direct a more like a duotaxis type of migration. We don't know yet, but I think it, it, it can be relevant. Um, all right. Um, so the last piece of work that I want to talk about is go another level up to focus on multicellular systems, uh, uh, including our recent mechanical uh, measurement and understanding of what's going on as a uh, tumor cluster developing 3D. So here is a model system of uh, breast cancer. Uh, it's developed uh, and pioneered by several groups, the Well Weaver, Mina Biso, and Abe Mooney. We simply just take this uh, and uh, do our mechanical measurement. Um, so as an example, um, here it shows is if we mix a little bit of mitrogel with alginate, you can do it with collagen. Um, if, and if I make a soft gel, 30 Pascal, and another stiff gel, 300 Pascal, I put in one MD, uh, 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 MCF10A cell, so human uh, breast epithelial cell, they will be trapped in 3D and slowly divide and develop into a memory SNR type of structure in the soft gel. And over weeks long, they always maintain a globular shape and never change. Um, however, if you look at the same cell in the uh, 300 Pascal, slightly stiffer gel, they become entirely chaotic. They evade very much like a breast cancer. Um, a little uh, closer look is here. Even in the 300 Pascal gel, they don't start off as uh, an invasive uh, cancer type of uh, morphology. They actually started with a very nice a globular spher uh, spheroid shape and even surrounded with a very nice base membrane structure. Um, and at about day five, they uh, start to invade. You can see uh, suddenly one cell jump out and then many others start to develop an invasive brand. Um, and you can scan different markers, for example, y maintain you will see more in the uh, uh, invading uh, branches. Um, this is how they look on day 14, okay? The whole process takes about 10 to 14 days. Um, and if you compare that with uh, uh, carcinoma, a type of uh, human breast cancer, the most common type, it looks very similar uh, morphologically. And as a comparison, this is a normal uh, breast SNR structure, okay? Um, so we are, uh, we'll use this as a model system to study how breast cancer develops in the lab. Um, all right, so just give you a little closer view of what's going on. We scan the cell nuclei with GFP nuclear localization signal, which allow us to see individual cell nucleus. On the left side is the bright field, on the right side is the confocal video of uh, the cluster on the fifth day. You can see that they spin together, which is another interesting topic that we're working on right now. Um, and uh, it's the same sample. If you put it back to the incubator, just wait another five days. Um, this is how they look on uh, day 10. You can see that the cluster is crazy. They, they really just uh, shoot out branches. The cells are migrating in and out really quickly. They're, they're doing all sort of uh, weird stuff. And obviously we can uh, track the cells and uh, uh, study how they migrate, which we will, and we'll present the data uh, in a little bit. But what I want to start with is uh, cell mechanics. Um, how mechanically those cells behave. Um, so uh, the method is, again, we use optical tweezers. Um, it's involving uh, that we need to put particles into each cell. We need to calibrate our tweezer to go into uh, deep into the tissue. So technically it really costs us two years to work on this. Um, but today I'll just present you the results. Um, so if I very naively uh, just separate the, the, the uh, cluster into three regimes, the core regime, the periphery regime, and the branch regime, you can clearly see that the cells in the branch is the softest. 
and the cells in the core is the most stiff ones with the cells on the periphery somewhat in the middle, closer to the branch. Um, this is measured by dragging a particle in the cytoskeleton, okay? Uh, all right, since we can measure um, um, individual cell mechanics in space and a time, we can see more details during the evolution of this cluster. Um, and here is a plot of the individual cell stiffness over time. Um, on day three, you, uh, the cluster is still small. There are about tens of cells, and they roughly have a very similar stiffness. Um, however, as time goes, on day five, the cluster is bigger. You can see more uh, some cells become stiffer, some cells become softer. The distribution is wider. Um, and uh, at day 10, after further development, clearly a lot more cells become very stiff and some cells become very soft. And interestingly, all the stiff cells are the ones in the core and all the softer ones are, are the ones in the branch. So there's a very clear spatial pattern of cell mechanics being developed. And this is sort of related to where you may find it similar to what people uh, already know that cancer cells are softer than healthy cells. Uh, those branch cells that they may be more aggressively uh, invading. Um, this is consistent. All right, um, since we have particles in the cell, we can very easily just look at how they mark, uh, how they fluctuate in the cytoplasm and uh, try to characterize the cytoplasmic dynamic. And here on the right is a video of how particles move in a living cell in general, and you can trace them and measure the mean square displacement. And it clearly you see that the cells in the branch have a much stronger intracellular dynamics. Everything moves faster, uh, including organelles, not only the particles, even when we measure with particles. Um, I just want to remind you this fast fluctuation in the cytoplasm is not a result of temperature, but rather is driven by active motor and enzymatic activities. So you can use this as a way to measure how strongly the motor activities are within single cell. Um, and uh, um, that was introduced in these papers uh, as a method called a full spectrum microscopy that we developed a couple of years back to use the particle fluctuation to directly measure force fluctuation within a single cell as a way to represent the overall enzymatic uh, activity. And as a result, when we measure this in the cluster, you find that the, uh, the cells in the branch have a much stronger fluctuation uh, and much stronger force fluctuation and a stronger enzymatic activity per se as compared to um, the, the cells in the core, which is in the blue color. Okay? The cells in the branch are more active, you can put it this way. Um, all right, if that's the case, um, you may wonder, um, does that mean this migration is also faster? Um, and the answer is yes. So here, again, I bring out this video that you already can see that cells migrate faster on, in the branch or on the outside as compared to the cells in the core. Um, and if I um, take a two hour time window and project the trajectory on this graph, you can see um, the red color represents a higher uh, mean speed um, that the cells in the branch and on the periphery clearly have a faster migration speed. And you can compare that uh, using a bar plot. Um, but uh, the main message up to now is basically within such a developing breast cancer model, the cells in the core have a higher stiffness and a weaker uh, uh, cytoplasmic activity and a force and a slower migration. The question is why? Why is this happening? Um, so in the last couple of years, we find that if you osmotically swell a cell, the cell will have more water inside and all the materials are more dilute and then the stiffness will reduce. Um, and because there are more water uh, and more space in the cell, dynamics is also easier. Um, and a similar result was also observed uh, by Jeff Bradberg's lab about 10 years ago. And the question is, would this volume or water content provide a possible explanation for the observed mechanics and dynamics patterns? Um, and uh, um, since in this model system, we label the cell nuclear with the GFP uh, nuclear localization signal, we can measure the nuclear volume quite easily. And in this system, and in fact, in many other uh, systems, uh, the ratio between nuclear volume and cell volume uh, always maintain a constant for each particular cell type. Okay? Um, so we basically use the nuclear volume as a, a measure for the whole cell size here. 
Um, and you can see for day three that when the cluster is small, there's only a few cells, um, they roughly have a similar cell size. However, as time goes on day five, there's a clear gradient being developed. The cells in the core are smaller. The cells in the, on the periphery are larger. And at day 10, it's even more clear cells in the branch are the largest and then periphery and then the core. So there's a very clear spatial pattern that you can see uh, quantitatively with this bar plot, um, or you can use some color uh, map, uh, spatial color map to see the distribution even more clear. Um, so the message is the cells in the invasive branch are bigger, softer, and more active compared to the core, which are smaller, stiffer, and less active. And there's a clear spatial pattern of cellular physical properties being developed over time. All right. Um, and uh, you may wonder and remind, uh, 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 recall the video that you just uh, saw. The cells are very actively migrating, right? And they're not only migrating within their regime, they actually often migrate from the branch to the core or the other way around. So here um, I pick up two examples. One is they migrate from the edge to the core in uh, about 10 hours. The other is migrate from the core to the edge in about six hours. So the question then becomes, if they actively migrate and swap their position in the region, how do they really maintain this mechanical pattern? It turns out the answer is rather simple. As cells migrate from the uh, edge to the core, they shrink their size. And as they migrate out, they swell. So they actually actively change their water content and therefore change the material concentration. Um, to summarize what's going on in the cell, uh, in the cluster, the cluster core have a, a higher number density, smaller volume, stiffer cells, and a slower migration. And if I measure individual cell property uh, uh, by following the, the, their migration in and out, uh, you can see that they trace the trend very nicely. So basically, as they migrate in and out, they actively change all their physical properties to adapt to the new microenvironment. So the take home message I want to emphasize here is, at least in this model system, cells don't carry their physical properties, but rather they adapt to the new microenvironment to have a new physical property. All right, um, so to quickly summarize the, the third part, um, you must wonder why there's a volume distribution, why there's a mechanics distribution, and why does it matter, right? Um, so the model system we use is the, uh, um, uh, breast uh, memory cancer that initiated from uh, epithelial cells. And most of the cancer are carcinoma, which are also originated from uh, epithelial cells. And as epithelial cells, they connect uh, with their neighbors by a special junction called a gap junction. It's the physical channel that allow anything below about 500 Dalton to go through. So they don't really control that. If you're small, you go through. Um, that includes water and ions very easily, right? And in the last couple of years, it become more and more clear that a tumor or a solid cluster, there's a higher compressive stress buildup in the center. And that means I can think of a cluster in my case or a tumor as a sponge. And there's a stronger compression in the core, which it rain the sponge from inside that push the water to flow from the core to the edge that shrink the cells in the core and swell the cells in the edge. That induced this uh, uh, spatial volume gradient, which then gave uh, rise to the stiffness gradient. Uh, we have more results in uh, this uh, citation that you can see how we demonstrate a, a gap junction is the reason here. And we also have some results to show if I use some uh, chemical or physical perturbations to change the cell mechanics and the cell size, I can actually influence how cells migrate in this model system to change how the cluster invade. So more details, please read this paper. Um, so we propose this the physical picture of cancer invasion with the hope to understand it um, from a different perspective. All right. Um, so con to conclude, uh, I talked about why maintaining as the intermediate filament is important in determining uh, strength, stretchability, and toughness. Uh, and I talked about how to probe cell ECM interaction and how cells create a stiff shell around them. And I also talked about the mechanics in uh, uh, multicellular systems. So if you're interested in more details, please look at those uh, papers um, and uh, acknowledge my group uh, funding and collaborators. Uh, all right, I'm over time, so thank you very much.
Thanks, Ming, for that really great talk. We actually have um, a lot of questions here, so we'll go through a couple of them. And um, I think in the interest of time, if we don't go through all of them, maybe we can just stay on at the end and um, talk about them a little bit more, or you can uh, uh, ask, answer them in the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, so first question from Georgia Skita is, there's an important difference between MCF10A, which are quasi-normal and non-invasive, um, so how does the oncogenic perturbations affect the processes it's for the, um, uh, I think, second part of your talk? Uh, this part, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. As you know, mcf 10 a if you simply just inject them into a mouse, they don't develop into a tumor. Um, so here is the different scenario that you need a, a, the supplement of mature gel and everything to kind of trigger it. More details, um, you should read this paper and another one by uh, Valerie Weaver, um, I think in Cashville, a couple of years, uh, about 10 years back. They, but each of them present a slightly different molecular mechanism of why this is happening. So more details, you should look at that since we simply just borrow the system and use it. A couple of questions about your uh, Vimentin experiments. So one from Andrea is asking if the mechanical properties are due to the absence of intermediate filaments or the substitution of vimentin with other intermediate filaments like keratin. And then likewise, uh, Vishali is asking how the keratin profile changes uh, in the vimentin knockdown with reduced migration. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so uh, that's, that is really, you know, is heavily involved in processes, uh, for example, EMT. But in this case, we purely focus on Wimentin. Therefore, when we knock out Wimentin, we, we don't really change other things. Uh, sort of, you know, independently only change Wimentin uh, as a way to focus on Wimentin. Um, uh, and the reason we choose Wimentin as our model system is also because Wimentin is the easiest uh, intermediate filament. It's really just encoded by one gene. Um, keratin is, you know, is uh, uh, regulated by several genes and therefore it's harder to control. Um, but collaborating with Bob Goldman's lab, we are currently thinking to also regulate the keratin. But in this case, um, there's no change. We, we don't do anything with keratin. Great. Um, Raphael is asking um, a few more experimental details. So for your optical tweezer measurements uh, where the beads are inside the cells, um, how do you calibrate them? And then how does the cytosol, cell organelles, filaments, et cetera, uh, influence the laser beam and how is the laser beam affecting them? So I guess, um, right, yeah, how are your measurements good. messing with the cells? <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, well, for sure, if you shine a laser on the cell for long enough, you are messing up with the cell. Um, um, th that's also why we need to reduce the laser power and do it really uh, transiently. Um, so within uh, about a couple of seconds, the measurement is okay. Um, that you can measure the laser power is weak enough. Um, uh, as a proof, uh, what we do is we shine a laser and do our measurement and uh, we um, look at a mitochondria network geometry, for example, you don't really see a change. Um, you can do your measurement on stem cells and they can divide, uh, they can differentiate as normal. Um, but if I shine the laser long enough, uh, that become really problematic. Um, so there's a fine line that you have to control yourself. Um, going back to calibration, for single cells, it's very easy. We just, uh, based on the index um, that we use, uh, um, um, I think glycerol with water with a certain concentration that match the index of the cell, then you can calibrate. In 3D, you have to do in-studio calibration. Uh, we use a method that initially is uh, uh, um, emitted by uh, Yale Goldman's lab at UPenn. Um, I think there's a PNAS paper uh, 2012 that you can read it to find more details based on the spectrum directly in studio to calibrate your tweezer. Uh, it's a very lengthy process. Okay, great. Um, there are a few more questions, but we're gonna go ahead and move on uh, to Nir Gov. So um, if you wanna, thank you Ming so much for that great talk. Uh, Nir, if you wanna start um, sharing your screen. Um, so thanks uh, for the talk. Thanks everyone for the questions. Next up, we have Professor Nir Gov. His background is in condensed matter physics. Um, but in the early 2000s, he switched to soft matter and biological physics. And Nir is a group leader in the Department of Chemical and Biological Physics at the Weizmann in Israel. Today, he'll be telling us about one dimensional 
cell motility patterns. Hi, everybody. Um, let me share the screen. Okay, does it work? Yep, it looks great. Thanks so much. Okay, so thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Adams. Thanks for all the organizers and thanks for you for logging in. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, briefly in uh, whatever I manage in half an hour about work that we just got accepted a week ago and we just got the proofs uh, today. So it's really hot from the oven and uh, the title will be explained in a second. So the motivation, sorry, the motivation for looking at one dimensional motility is not so clear, so maybe I need to give uh, some motivation for the audience, especially after Ming showed some beautiful um, live imaging of uh, cells moving in three dimensions. But apparently, actually, three dimensions is sometimes one dimensional, uh, although that sounds sort of uh, strange. And the reason is that on many occasions, for example, shown here, uh, cancer cells are actually expanding away from the main tumor along one dimensional uh, lines or streams. And that can be shown more nicely, I think, in this movie, which uh, Neil and Pascal uh, gratefully sent me, uh, that comes from uh, this uh, publication given below. And that shows uh, cancer cells that are moving along blood vessels um, and uh, uh, expanding away from the main tumor. And you can see that they move naturally along one dimensional like uh, substrates, which can be very narrow capillaries or axons of uh, neurons, etc. Um, this is a sort of uh, a cartoon that comes from the publication given below that summarizes the motivation for looking at uh, the motion of cells along one dimensional stripes. Uh, which will be the, the case that I will be talking about in the talk and why that is actually motivated by the real expansion of uh, cells away from the tumor, especially for a uh, brain tumor, which is a terrible disease, as you all know. Um, from the physics point of view, and as Jennifer said, I'm a physicist, uh, it's also the simplest thing uh, for studying motility of cells. We cannot think of uh, a simpler dimensionality, a lower dimensionality that will allow us to um, experiment and uh, model uh, migration. As shown in this movie, for example, that comes from uh, Neil Gauthier and Pascal Monzo's lab, um, uh, such a glioma cell that uh, lands on a stripe uh, is first expanding and then moving. In this case, it was also dividing, but clearly it's, um, its motility is, um, is there and it can be studied in a much more simple manner as opposed to even two-dimensional free motion in a plane. Uh, so these are the people that did the work that I will tell you about. Uh, Jonathan, who is uh, my PhD student uh, in Weizmann, uh, Raphael Vautouré, who is a collaborator and a good friend from Paris. And um, there is uh, the experimental group of Neil and Pascal from uh, Milano from Italy. Okay, yeah. Uh, just to show you that they are related to each other. <laughs> um, and as I said, this paper is uh, just accepted, so it will soon appear in physical review research. And for the time being, you can see it on the archive. Okay, so one uh, interesting puzzle that I think uh, uh, makes uh, even one dimensional motion of cells uh, an unsolved problem is the heterogeneity observed in the migration patterns that one can see even in identical cells um, uh, population. So this variability, this cell-to-cell -cell variability is observed if you, even if you watch a single cell moving uh, as function of time, or if you look at the population uh, as an ensemble. Some cells are just spreading and not polarizing. Some are polarizing, some are moving in stick slip, like this one that was moving in a stip, stick slip motion in the top. Others are crawling very smoothly, uh, but are very elongated. Others are much shorter and moving much faster, as this one is, for example. So there's a whole uh, ver variety of, uh, of um, um, uh, behaviors which one would want 
uh, ideally to explain within one unified and a simple or a minimal framework for describing this uh, behavior. So these are a couple of publications that uh, are already out there. One showing this very interesting stick slip motion for these uh, uh, glioma cells, again, on one dimensional lines. And that is an earlier work that uh, Neil and Pascal were involved in. And one can see clearly that while the, the, the back of the cell is sometimes extending backwards uh, from the direction of motion, which is in towards the top, there is a quick retraction, and these are indeed those cycles of stick slip, while the front is changing its velocity very slightly, but is continuing in the same direction. Another study which came out earlier this year shows this cell spreading, and while it is spreading, it is not moving anywhere, and it is remaining unpolarized. At some point, the, the back gets detached, and then the cell is actually moving to the right, then undergoes another cycle, so there was a clear two or three cycles of stick slip also for this cell. So um, what could explain such a stick slip? So clearly the adhesions play an important role and the adhesions that the cell has to the substrate are very different from the front to the back. While in the front they are initiated and they mature and all of that is because of, is thought today to be because of this actin flow on top of them, the back uh, are simply um, lingering uh, until they are detached. So there is a very uh, different behavior. They don't mature at the back. They are already matured and they simply uh, seem to detach. And the overall uh, environment is very different. While those in the front have actin flowing over them, those in the back uh, usually don't have such a strong actin flow over them, and they simply need to be uh, detached away from uh, the substrate in order to allow the cell to move forward. So we will treat uh, in this uh, model uh, the two edges of the cell very differently. If an edge of a cell is protruding, we will essentially, uh, for the time being, ignore the dynamics of the adhesion and assume that it is of some given fixed value that allows to convert the actin uh, a treadmilling into a protrusive force. And we will only concentrate on the dynamics of the slip bonds that exist in the back. That's, that's a simplification that in the future would need to be um, uh, removed and a, a more elaborate description should follow for the uh, protruding edges as well. I mean, from the point of view of the adhesion there. So the simplest model is as follows. We have a cell which is one dimensional. It has some uh, uh, spring-like behavior which describes the mechanical connection between the front and the back um, through the membrane and through uh, the, the intermediate filaments that Ming was describing and through the, the entire uh, internal part of the cell. This can be again extended to a viscoelastic description, but here we kept it as simple as possible. Um, there is a rest length L0 for this uh, elastic object, but um, it can be stretched uh, and it can be stretched by a lot if, if K is small enough, of course. Um, uh, there is, of course, the, the restoring force of the, of the spring that acts on both ends. In the front, we also have this protrusive activity due to the treadmilling flow of the actin, which let's say in this cell is already determined to be from the right end towards the left end. Uh, there is some unspecified drag force which acts also on this end to give us uh, uh, the velocity of this uh, point. And a similar balance of forces happens at the back, only that at the back we have slip bonds that give an effective friction. How do we describe that effective friction? We basically followed a very nice paper by Pierre uh, from 2013, uh, where again, these adhesions are described by stochastic linkers that uh, attach and detach. And while they are attached, they can be stretched. And when they stretch, they provide some restoring force. And that can be worked out. So the adhesion dynamics is uh, explicitly described in the model. N is the uh, proportion of attached linkers. And the assumption is that they behave as slip bonds, which means that they tend to detach more easily if there is a pulling force that is uh, pulling on them. And that gives us essentially at the end of the day, the expression of this effective friction that they exert on this backside of the cell. 
So altogether, at the end of the day, we have for this simplified model, just two equations of motion, but they are coupled to each other. One is for the length, the length of the, of the whole cell, because we combine the xf dot and the xb dot, and we just take the difference between them to give us the length dynamics and the dynamics of the attached linkers at the back. And the two important parameters, I mean, there are several parameters here, but many of them are related to the, to the um, internal uh, properties of these linkers, which we don't think are so easily changed as function of time by the cell, because these proteins have some fixed uh, given properties. What can be changed uh, over time and with different surfaces is, of course, the overall stickiness, the bare stickiness of these linkers to the substrate, and maybe also the cell elasticity. So in this space of uh, yx is given the stickiness and xx is the elasticity, we find that there is the following phase diagram. To the right of this blue curve, or actually the blue and the red curve, there are only smooth moving cells. For example, the cell that is shown here in this uh, black dot here is moving very smoothly after an initial um, oscillation, it's moving very, very smoothly, and it's uh, maintaining a fixed length and some uh, low level of adhesion uh, molecules at the back, and indeed that goes well with the fact that it has a low stickiness to the substrate. And its overall velocity is actually quite fast compared to the same cell when we move to higher adhesive um, substrate. If you move into this regime, which is denoted by this uh, blue curve here, we go into the stick slip regime where there are large oscillations in this um, uh, proportion of attached linkers. Essentially, we have an avalanche effect as the front is, uh, is, uh, is uh, protruding forward. The uh, force which is building up on these uh, linkers is large enough to cause this catastrophic detachment of many of them together. And once you cross a critical proportion of them that have detached, those that remain can have no chance of uh, upholding the force and they just detach completely. And you can see in the, in, the, in the panels here, this limit cycle behavior in the space given by the adhesion concentration and the length of the cell. So this dynamical system, has a deterministic limit cycle. Okay, um, I want to uh, uh, show here the bistable regime, which is essentially a regime where both smooth motion and um, and stick slip uh, coexist. Okay, and finally, you can be in a high stickiness regime or high stick in the substrate. Now you see that the cell is much more elongated. Uh, there is so many uh, attached um, uh, linkers that they can actually sustain this uh, pulling force, which is pulling from the front through the spring. So there's no problem. They don't uh, detach catastrophic catastrophically. Um, but the overall um, a large number of such linkers means there is a large drag, a large friction. So the cell is wide and moving much more s s uh, slowly but smoothly. And you can see here in the phase diagram that all the uh, flows go into a fixed point and not to a limit cycle anymore. Okay, so this is indeed this uh, bistable regime where you can actually start from stick slip and go spontaneously into the smooth um, or vice versa. Now, if we compare this simple model to uh, the details of the stick slip as it is seen in these experiments, we can actually measure the vinculin, which is a sort of a proxy for how strong are the adhesion molecules adhered or what's the proportion of the adhesion at the back. As I said, we disregard for the moment the adhesion in the front, which is under a different uh, regime. Uh, it's not a simple uh, slip bond behavior. Um, and we can actually, at the same time, also uh, roughly um, know what is the length of the cell. Although the cell here seems to be leaving some pieces behind, we can still know where is the uh, uh, contingent part of the cell. And if we actually analyze, or in fact, Neil and, and, uh, and Pascal analyze such, uh, cycles of stick slip, we can actually see that in this space of cell length and amount of vinculin at the back, there are there, there is a nice uh, um, 
limit cycle, which at least qualitatively uh, resembles the, the limit cycle that we predict uh, in the model. So at least qualitatively, such a simple model with what we think are the minimal ingredients that one can think of um, immediately gives a realistically looking stick slip behavior. And also at the same time is able to describe smooth motion of two forms, uh, short and fast and uh, elongated and slow. Okay, um, we can actually look at some chemographs uh, that come from the experiment and some of them actually show an interesting behavior where the cell was performing a stick slip uh, with a, um, low frequency but large amplitude oscillations and then it switched to a much higher frequency and small amplitude oscillations. And we can recover at least qualitatively such a behavior if indeed the cell started in the stick slip at large uh, adhesion and then spontaneously move to a low adhesion behavior. Um, why would, uh, why would uh, suddenly the cell substrate adhesion change? Well, uh, I'll show you in a minute why we think that that could be a, a very likely possibility. Another example is a cell which is shown in this chemograph. It was moving slowly and it was uh, elongated and then it switched to something much shorter and fast. Again, that would correspond in this simple model to moving from this regime all the way down to here, uh, from the slow and elongated cell to the uh, short and fast cells. And again, will be recoverable in the model if there was a sudden jump or relatively sudden jump in the cell substrate adhesion or stickiness parameter. Now, when you look more closely on these um, adhesive stripes, which are being painted on the cover slide for these cells to move in one dimension, you actually do see that if you fluorescently tag um, the laminin, which is, uh, which is used as the, as the substrate, there are large variations uh, in this fluorescence, which could very well trigger such a sudden changes in the cell substrate adhesion. So it's, at least it's a very likely possibility, but other sources of noise surely exist, such as noise in the actin polymerization, etc. Okay, so the model I showed you so far is the simplest one you could even imagine. I mean, you could even give it maybe as an exercise to a grad student, but don't forget that what we did here is that we plugged in the retrograde, the retrograde flow by hand. And that is of course not satisfactory if we want to talk about uh, cell polarization. So we go back to a work that uh, I was also involved with a few years ago, which actually proposed, uh, again, a minimalistic model for how to polarize, self-polarize a cell. And the idea is that basically you couple the retrograde flow to some concentration profile of some polarity Q. Now this polarity Q uh, in previous works was mostly uh, myosin uh, motors, myosin two motors, which uh, provide contractility so that if they are pushed to the back by the retro retrograde flow, their own contractility can actually feed back on making the retrograde flow faster. And that was the positive feedback which allowed the cell, the cell to self-polarize. Um, here, we rather want to talk about the polarity Q as an inhibitor. So actually when you're pushing this inhibitor to the back, you inhibit the acting polymerization activity or the protrusive activity or the lamellipodia activity at the back. And the front is of course now clear of this inhibitor. And this is again, giving you the positive feedback that we need in order to provide a model for the cell to self polarize. So now we have a, a, a model where the cell is completely symmetric. It's a demo democratic model where you have uh, actin flows that begin in both directions. And of course, what determines the overall profile is the difference between them. So they are coupled through this polarity concentration profile. And again, just like we did in that um, 2015 cell paper and, and in other papers since, we uh, simplify by assuming that this polarity Q uh, exponential concentration is uh, instantaneously adapting to the changes in the velocity of the actin retrograde flow. So, we assume that the acting retrograde flow has a time scale of changing its uh, uh, amplitude and, and direction, which is of the order of uh, uh, um, minutes, and the polarity Q can uh, reorganize itself to the uh, something which is close to the exponential profile in um, a much shorter time scale. 
So this shows here this uh, relation between the local polymerization activity, VF and VB, uh, to the local concentration of this inhibitor. And of course, there are some uh, parameters. CS is the, is the saturation uh, parameter, and beta is the coupling parameter. So if you solve this uh, uh, model, you see immediately that what you get is that when the cell is too short, then both retrograde flows are equal, so there is no net polarization of the cell, and you must get over a critical length in order for one of them, let's say here, define it to be the front, to win over the back. And the back has always some residual uh, acting polymerization activity, but it can be much, much reduced, uh, unlike in this example, where actually they are uh, only a factor of two or so different. So what that model allows us is to show that in some cells can actually spread evenly now, symmetrically, and never reach the critical length as shown here in this panel. The critical length here in this example is way over 10 uh, in dimensionless units. And here the, the, the um, asymptotic length of this cell is uh, much longer than the rest length of this uh, imaginary uh, spring, which is always fixed to one, but it still does not reach the critical length for polarization. And of course, there are many examples in the chemographs for such cells. Um, if you cross the critical length, like this cell here, cross the critical length, which is denoted by the dashed line, it can actually uh, uh, grow evenly and then begin to move, uh, of course, arbitrarily to the right or to the left. Uh, if you crank up the, this uh, feedback between the uh, polarity Q and the actin polymerization, you can enter the, um, the stick slip regime. But now, although you might be very happy with this uh, stick slip behavior, which, by the way, is very persistent by itself, it, it does not induce uh, the cell to, to change its direction of motion. And you can see the same thing happening in the chemograph. But what is different is that in the chemographs, it's clear that the lamellipodia is moving backwards. And that can only happen if the length of the cell after retraction is actually below the critical length, so that now it actually loses polarization and has to grow uh, evenly in both directions. And that, and that can actually happen um, if we introduce a finite dynamics to the uh, actin flow, so that the actin flow does not follow immediately this uh, uh, relation, this feedback relation between the inhibition and the actin flow. The actin flow has some time in which it can actually, it needs to adjust its local flow to the level of the, of the inhibitor. And now you can see that the length goes below the critical length and there are these stall periods where the cell actually grows evenly in both directions. And that resembles much more this backward moving lamellipodia. In fact, during those short times where the cell loses polarization, if there is now noise on top of it, you can actually induce changes in overall migration direction. And as you actually increase this um, uh, uh, time scale for um, for uh, for um, this time scale for uh, the actin to readjust to the to the um, um, to the uh, polarity Q changes, you can actually get more and more often uh, direction changes. Um, again, I show you here another example that comes from the experiment where we uh, analyzed more carefully. A, a stick slip behavior extracted the length of the cell and the speed of the center of mass. And you can actually plot now speed versus length. And you can see that there is this limit cycle, which resembles very uh, closely the behavior that we have in the, in the model. And another example, which uh, has a different kind of uh, stick slip behavior, which again, much more noisy in the experiments, but the idea is that we think that there are these underlying deterministic migration modes, which are there in the behavior of the cells, but of course, they are addressed by a lot of noise. Um, and of course, in the experiments, you can get a rich a variety of behaviors. For example, if you look at the, the right a bottom panel, you can see a cell that was uh, performing these stick slip behaviors and then went into mitosis, which for us means essentially a non-motile cell. And then the two daughter cells, one was actually moving very smoothly with uh, no stick slip in the back and the other one was actually showing some nice, again, cycles of stick slip. And again, we can recover that by just uh, giving slightly different uh, parameter values 
to the two daughter cells. Um, so that's just, uh, of course, for illustration. So just to conclude, I think what our model suggests is that a lot of the variability that you see in cell to cell, which should be identical, the cells are identical, or in a population of identical cells, could come from fluctuations in the cellular components, for example, in the strength of the adhesion to the substrate or polymerization activity. And that can shift the cell from one deterministic migration mode to another, let's say from stick slip to smooth motion. And that could seem like a very large variability in behavior, but in fact, it could only uh, entail a, a rather small, um, or uh, not small, but a, a fluctuation in an in internal parameter, which can very well exist in nature and can account for some of this variability. By the way, deterministic patterns is something that we already found in a previous work some time ago, but that was very, very specific to dendritic cells. So again, that was uh, a sort of uh, a teaser for what we have now, because now we actually show a model that shows such deterministic oscillatory behavior um, uh, for many cell types, not, not specific to, to these uh, dendritic cells. Um, another conclusion of this model is that in this uh, UCSP model of self-polarization through coupling of actin flow to some polarity Q, there is an emergent critical length which is uh, inherent in the model, which below it, the cell is unpolarized, and in this case, just uh, uh, widens symmetrically, and above this length, it actually becomes polarized. Um, as you are uh, going below this critical length, you lose polarity, and that can allow you to change direction. For example, in you, if, if you happen to do stick sleep, then during each sleep event after retraction, you could be approaching that length or even go below it, and now noise can make you change direction. And indeed, if you see an example of a chemograph from this work, which I show here, this cell is, is making stick sleep, and just after the last retraction, you see it is much, much shorter than it was before, it actually switched direction. So noise plus the fact that you are retracted in stick sleep and approached or went below the critical length could be just the trigger to cause you to change direction. Otherwise, stick sleep can maintain your persistence uh, without any problem. Um, as I said, the challenge for the future is to add to this model a, a more realistic treatment of this adhesion clutch dynamics at the front, at the protruding ends of the cell. I, I show you a, a nice cartoon that comes from this archive paper by Pierre, uh, which which uh, just appeared now on the on the archive. And I list here some works that maybe many of you know by Dave Odie and and, and Vivek Shinoi that uh, also explored this. This uh, this um, uh, clutch model. Um, it might be even more complicated in the front because, uh, for example, this nice work showed that the front lamellipodia tends to have these running ways that go to and fro the edge of the cell, and that of course um, makes life more complicated for the modeling point of view if one actually wants to capture that dynamics. Uh, an even bigger challenge, which I can uh, hint to you that we're already involved in, is to use such a model that I provide, propose to you today for one-dimensional motion to talk about one-dimensional collective motion, as was recently nicely showed by Benoit's group um, in this Nature Physics paper. And uh, again, the idea is to go beyond uh, a, a simple uh, particle model models, as was actually shown in this uh, uh, nature physics and to treat the cell more realistically, but still, as I hope I convinced you, in a manageable way, uh, in, a, in, a, in a minimalistic way. So it looks uh, already like a complicated model with uh, many parameters, but we think it's still a minimalist model that is still manageable and tractable for both very, very simple numerics and also to gain understanding about these uh, complicated uh, processes. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Nira. That was that was really great. Um, I learned a lot. I just want to, before we get into the questions, just want to remind everyone that if you post in the chat quest, the word question, we'll call on you and you can um, ask a question yourself or keep on posting the questions directly in the chat. Um, so I actually just wanted to start. Um, as you know, I'm an experimentalist, and so I'm always sort of uh, 
odd when when these simple models can do such a good job of capturing cell behaviors. And um, this might be kind of a stupid question, I'm not sure, but I was just wondering, your model can predict these um, different modes of migration, but is there any way it can tell us uh, which one we should expect, right? Which one's the most common? Um, you know, can it can it can it predict anything about the behavior in that way? So I, I think the problem is, for example, is that you have a cell a priori. Um, we would need in order to predict to know some uh, basic parameters that appear in the model. For example, how adhesive, how sticky is this cell to the substrate? How stiff is this cell to length changes? How strong is the acting polymerization activity at the edges of the cell? Um, all of these can, can greatly change between cells and, um, and uh, uh, cell types. So um, I think one would need to characterize that. I mean, I think what is probably more useful is that once you have a cell and you characterize these basic parameters to fit the model, you can now use the model to predict what would happen to, happen to these cells if they, for example, you put them on, on a more or less sticky substrate, or if you now cause the acting polymerization to be enhanced or diminished and things like that. So. I think one would need to calibrate where is your cell, your wild type cell or your normal cell in this phase diagram of, yes, several parameters without which uh, you cannot start the calculation and then know how to move from there um, to different behaviors of the cell. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that would be a really cool way to do an interaction though between the model and, and experiments. So it's very cool. Yeah. And actually, I would I would like to say that um, in this paper that we just uh, published now, it's more a theory paper in the sense that we just put out there this framework. And yes, we make some comparisons to to chemograph some experiments as they showed, but it's not it's not a systematic uh, experimental study to test the model. So one would actually like to do a systematic mod uh, a study now. For example. Just like just like came out now in the discussion, take a cell and now systematically uh, vary the average value of uh, of adhesive uh, substrate that you present to that cell and see if indeed you can uh, move through the different phases of migration. Or let's say since each cell has some variability, the cloud of your uh, behaviors moves over this uh, phase diagram with the proportion of cells showing the different phases. Uh, changing as you predict from the model. That would be a very nice systematic way to put this uh, model to the test, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Adam, do you wanna ask the next one? Yeah, uh, <laughs> so question from uh, Ricard Lertz. This is, uh, I just, I just got to do one second, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I'm back with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, Thanks. that's the problem. Corona time, home. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no problem. Uh, yeah, Ricard, Ricard says, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you take protrusion forces to be proportional to retrograde flow velocity vector. Is this velocity fixed or does it depend on cell migration speed? Do you take this into account? So, okay. So in the, in the full model that I described at the end, but was actually speeding through it, you can see that there is a local retrograde flow, or maybe you can think of it as polymerization rate at each of the ends of the cell. And that local uh, polymerization rate is what is pushing the cell. So the difference between VB and VF uh, is the net flow within the cytoplasm, which we think of as giving this polarity Q uh, asymmetry between front and back. But locally, each of these uh, local polymerization velocities is providing the local protrusive force towards the front and towards the back. And that, that needs to be calculated self-consistently in the model because that depends on the uh, amount of inhibitor, as you see here, in the front and in the back. And that amount of inhibitor is actually provided by this exponential, which depends on each of these velocities in turn. So that needs to be solved self-consistently. So we do not assume that these velocities are fixed. They are solved self-consistently in the model. Nice. Okay, we have a question um, from YouTube um, from uh, Suvakash who asks, can the mode of migration change 
from stick slip to crawling? Um, can that happen with the variation of the relative stiffness due to change in substrate stiffness? Yeah, so I would guess that substrate stiffness, as we all know by now from so many works, changes the effective adhesiveness of the substrate to the to the cell. So, I mean, roughly, I would say uh, stiffer substrates, if I remember the literature, uh, uh, provide the cell with a stickier substrate. So the cells uh, tend to stick more to a stiffer substrate. So one could also view... Uh, where is it? Yeah, one could also view moving along this e uh, y-axis, which is surface stickiness, uh, by changing uh, substrate stiffness with increased stiffness, giving you higher uh, net or overall uh, stickiness and uh, softer substrates, giving you a weaker um, uh, adhesiveness. Yeah. Great. Um, Suvam is asking uh, about experimental data that might be uh, supportive of the model. So have you, he asked, have you seen and quantified the contribution of catch bonds by labeling integrins to see the trends of the mechanical parameters you evaluated for slip bonds? Uh, well, I, we, we haven't, we haven't uh, attempted any such a molecular scale comparison. Um, I would say that the treatment that we have employed for the slip bonds uh, sorry, where is the slip bonds? It's, it's here. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the treatment of these slip bonds, which means that the larger the force which is pulling on them, the larger is their off rate. Um, I mean, I don't remember now offhand what was the references that actually explored that on the molecular scale, but I think there are molecular level uh, papers with AFM that have um, analyzed such uh, relations. So these are the simplest relations one can think of from the point of view of uh, the physics of such an energy landscape of a, of a molecule that can be um, uh, um, mechanically uh, modified upon the application of a force. Um, but I think also this was uh, checked, but that is only the slip bond part. Uh, the question is about the catch bond is a very good question. And as I said, we have so far ignored uh, the part where we know that the catch bonds actually play the biggest role, and that is in the front, in the protruding part of the cell. Of course, the protruding part here can be both in the front or change towards the back, but the protruding part of the cell is where uh, um, adhesions initiate and grow and mature, and uh, and that is due to the catch bond properties uh, of how focal adhesions actually uh, increase in size and in strength. And we have ignored all of that, and as I said, that would be a very worthy uh, future uh, addition to this model. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Giorgio who says, what about the effect of potentially long range membrane tension? Um, I guess longer cells may experience higher membrane tension and this may impact on stick slip behavior. Right, so um, at the moment, as I said, it's a simple spring uh, that describes the mechanical connection between the two ends of the cell. So as long as that description is uh, reasonable, um, uh, when it's at, uh, at least truly the simplest, but uh, as long as it is, um, roughly okay, roughly realistic. Uh, of course, what is this effective K that describes a very composite object like a cell? Is, is, is your guess as good as mine? Um, and, and, uh, and probably there is no simple way of uh, calculating that from uh, first principles. Um, but surely there is a membrane component that as Giorgio says, uh, so stiffening the membrane or stiffening some of the uh, intermediate filaments like uh, Ming was describing will surely make the cell overall stiffer and that will make the uh, two ends of this one dimensional cell uh, much more uh, rigidly connected to each other. Um, now, if, um, if, if uh, nonlinear elasticity is uh, becoming uh, very important at some point, that should be easily incorporated into the model just by changing this a uh, spring for, from a linear spring to a nonlinear spring. If one knows that there is a clear nonlinearity uh, because of some membrane contribution or some other uh, cytoskeletal contribution, one can easily 
uh, explore what would that do into the model. I can't tell you offhand because nonlinearities, as we all know, can uh, can uh, cause all kinds of interesting uh, behaviors. I mean, they are behind all of these phases that we are looking at here. Um, so uh, that could be possibility to look at in the future. Yeah. Right. And the uh, final questions from Ming. Uh, Ming, do you want to ask the question yourself, or? Do you sure. I, I I can't really talk in here. Um, Thank you. I, I yes, remember I, I I read a paper many years ago saying some migration on two D is very different than with the one D and the three D. And you also mentioned at the beginning, one D and the three D are similar. Can you comment more from the uh, your perspective as to what are you thinking in terms of this? So I, I, you know, I think this is very, very good question because at the end of the day, we want these uh, cells that are moving here on these 1D lines to be relevant to what is uh, seen uh, in vivo uh, or even in vitro, just like you have in your lab, but in a three-dimensional setting. So, okay, so it, it's a good question. I don't think anybody knows a good answer because on the one hand, uh, let me go back to that. I mean, on the one hand, yeah, if you look at the, at the cells moving through an ECM, then one can think of um, the ECM uh, as a very dilute uh, structure with cells actually going up on ropes or very narrow pillars. That could be one uh, limit. On, uh, in a very dense ECM, they would actually need to drill a hole through, and then they would actually be moving more like uh, through a one-dimensional channel. Um, uh, than in 3D. Um, and in between, they might actually be moving like uh, in this movie along the outside of, of narrow uh, blood vessels. And um, that could be actually moving along the outside of very narrow cylinders. So that if only one cell wide pretty much covers the entire uh, cylindrical surface of these very narrow capillaries, that will probably be the closest in, in, in behavior to the, to the experiments where they are moving along a, a flat uh, stripe, which is just uh, one, one cell wide. So uh, I know that, for example, both uh, Benoit and Pascal Silberzan have experimented in vitro with cells moving on the outside of very narrow cylinders and inside very narrow uh, cylinders. And... Um, I would say they are not identical to moving along a flat stripe, which is the data that they showed here, but in some senses they are similar. I would say more similar if you go on the outside of such cylinders, uh, like, like shown in this movie on the capillaries, versus if you go through um, uh, the inside surface of a cylinder. Um, if you go within a very narrow channel, which is just one cell wide that uh, the, the leader cell has, has drilled through the, the dense ECM, um, again, that might go back to being more similar to the 1D um, works that are done in, uh, in vitro, like uh, Mathieu Piel is, done a lot, is doing a lot of, of these cells moving in very narrow channels, uh, which are one cell wide. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think there's no simple answer, but throughout these uh, variety of motions, um, I think uh, at least some of them are close enough. Um, yeah, I think, I think for sure the one dimensional um, behavior that I showed here is very uh, nice for us theoretical physicists as a starting point to, to, uh, to jump with our modeling um, but surely the, the, the more complicated behaviors of uh, two dimensions uh, and, and three dimensions, like you showed with many, many cells moving on top of each other, um, remains to be tackled. But uh, yeah, yeah, that would be more complicated. All right, great. Um, I think we have reached the end of the questions. Um, so thank you both for such wonderful talks and we'll see everybody next week. <laughs>